Good morning, everyone. Welcome to today's Continuity Housing Webinar, The 17 Mistakes Organizations Make in Creating Their Emergency Plans and How to Correct Them. I'm Michelle Lowther with Continuity Housing, where we provide our clients with contractually guaranteed hotel rooms for the critical employees of larger and mid-sized companies in order to help prevent a business disruption in the event of a crisis. We have created a patent pending program which secures and protects hotel rooms for critical personnel as well as their families and pets if needed while saving companies significant expense. Each member of our team has at least 10 years of experience in the hotel industry and I'm proud to say Continuity Housing has a 100% success record with our client deployments. If you'd like information on how you can receive a 30-minute analysis of your current housing plan or a strategy session about how to create a housing plan, you can visit us at continuityhousing.com or just leave a comment in the survey that will pop up today at the end of the webinar. This and all Continuity Housing webinars are recorded and they are available on the Continuity Housing YouTube channel. After the presentation today, you'll receive a link to the recording via email as well as the slide deck that we use in the presentation. And that's going to be especially handy today after you see how much content we're about to cover in the next 45 to 60 minutes or so. Um, please, please feel free to share that link to the recordings with your peers and anybody else that you think might be interested. We've got a lot of good stuff today. So speaking of the presentation, Sandy Hook, the Boston Marathon bombing, the Aurora, Colorado theater shootings, and Hurricane Sandy all emphasize that emergency planning for your workplace can be a matter of life and death, and such planning is subject to many federal, state, and local laws, regulations, and standards. Most who are tasked with creating and maintaining emergency plans are confused or overwhelmed regarding those standards. Learn what laws, regulations, and standards apply to your emergency planning, training, and exercises. You'll learn what a lawsuit will do to you if you don't create a plan to standard and learn the 17 mistakes and we will number them organizations make in creating their plans today and how to correct them we've got five primary objectives today the first is what are the laws the regulations and standards that control emergency plans second how will lawsuits affect you and your organization third what should be the overriding attitude for managers in reevaluating current planning fourth how can your own employees and clients hurt your response to a disaster? And last, what should you expect by way of help from local municipalities? We're very fortunate today to have a world-renowned presenter. Bo Mitchell was police commissioner of Wilton, Connecticut for 16 years. He retired in February of 2001 to found 911 Consulting, which creates emergency, disaster recovery, business continuity, crisis communications, and pandemic plans, plus training and exercises for organizations such as GE, Hyatt Hotel Corporation, MasterCard, many colleges and universities, plus 26 secondary schools. He serves clients headquartered from Boston to LA, working in their facilities from London to San Francisco. Bo has earned 16 certifications in Homeland Security, Emergency Management, Disaster Recovery, Business Continuity, Safety, and Security. He also serves as an expert in landmark court cases nationally. So with that, <laughs> good morning, Bo. Thanks so much for joining us today. Thanks, Michelle. We're going to talk about the uh, common mistakes uh, in your emergency plans. Uh, we're going to list 17 here. Uh, and really what we're talking about is protecting your people, your property, your productivity, and your posterior. These are the benefits uh, that come to you by correcting uh, mistakes in your emergency plans. Uh, that's what I look like. I'm Bo Mitchell. As Michelle mentioned, I was police commissioner of Wilton, Connecticut for 16 years. I retired in 2001, February, to start 911 Consulting to work with facilities like yours for the protection of employees in your facilities. All those initials after my name indicate that I'm trained and board certified 14 different times in emergency management, disaster recovery, business continuity, corporate security, campus safety and security, high rise safety and security, active shooters, workplace violence, and a bunch of other stuff, all of which we're going to talk about today. Uh, as Michelle mentioned, I am an expert uh, consultant in landmark legal cases where the settlements for facilities like yours, when somebody gets hurt or killed, are in the billions of dollars, the negligence issues at court, or failure to plan and failure to train, the very things we're going to talk about today. 
These are our clients. We work for a lot of headquarters companies uh, across this country, as well as uh, as well as their facilities in the in the field. And we've worked in 29 campuses, countrywide, 25 secondary schools. I've also worked in 37 high rises nationwide, from Kansas City to New York, from Boston to San Francisco, including 14 high rises in New York City including the Waldorf Astoria, arguably the second safest house in America because the people who live in the first safest house in America come here on average every two weeks. The president, the first lady, the vice president, the secretary of something very important. The Secret Service keeps a permanent installation at the Waldorf Astoria 24-7, 365, and it's the only building in the world that has its own train station and its own parking lot dedicated to one person exclusively and has since FDR was president during World War II. I've also worked in the building on the right, number seven World Trade Center, for the 500 bankers on the top three floors, 50, 51, 52. You think you have challenges. So you can ask the question, why should I care about emergency action plans? Let's start with the basics. And the basics are that you have a duty of care a legal responsibility uh, that is a core management responsibility for every employer in the United States of America, it doesn't matter where you are. And that core management responsibility of duty of care gets expressed in planning. And this is the planning continuum that every uh, organization, every employer is supposed to have if you comply with the national standard. We'll come back in a moment to that national standard. Emergency action plans, crisis communications plan, disaster recovery, business continuity, and pandemic. This is a continuum of planning that starts with the emergency action plan when then thereafter all these others kick in. So an emergency plan. Do you have an emergency plan? Well, that question gets asked in national surveys all the time. And over the last 10 years, employers like you in national surveys come back and 30 to 80 percent say they have an emergency action plan. Now, we have a problem here right from the beginning. 20% of employers in the United States of America are willing to admit to surveys time and time again uh, on a national level they don't have an emergency plan. Uh, OSHA says there are 7 million employers in the United States, so that means 1.4 million employers in the United States are willing to admit to somebody taking surveys over the last decade continually that they don't have an emergency action plan. Now, you may think that those 1.4 million are the gas station or the deli down the street, and the answer is that's wrong. It's a bell-shaped curve representing the entire population. So it includes Fortune 500 companies and many campuses across this great land of ours. And what is this 30 to 80 percent when people are asked, do you have an emergency action plan? There seems to be a good deal of hesitation and uh, diffidence here. And the answer is to this phenomenon is that most employers don't know what an emergency action plan is. They really don't know what it is. So do you have an emergency action plan? Well, when I go into facilities, I ask for an emergency action plan, and it comes back and it's a disaster recovery plan with a tornado thrown in, or it's all about data, not about people. Is it even called an emergency action plan? Is it all hazards? Is it trained annually? Is it trained to all employees? Is it OSHA compliant? That's an emergency action plan, and that should be the way you will, you, you will look at it. Certainly after this presentation, that's what my recommendation is going to be. So we're going to focus on the first of these plans, this continuum planning, the emergency action plan. And these four transitive verbs are important to you because in each of your states, these are defined by law. A plan is written on comprehensive, all has its structures with goals, strategy, tactics, roles, and authority of employees to respond in the emergency plan organized for that plan. To train is to teach, to drill is to test, to exercise is to test, rehearse skills using simulations. Uh, under law in your state, training is not drilling, drilling is not training, uh, false alarms aren't drills. So I am going to use these words in their legal sense as practice in your state. I have looked at 500 emergency plans over the last 14 years. Guess how many were OSHA compliant? One. Now you see my client list, it's not the Bo Mitchell Storm Door Factory. These are Fortune 500 companies and campuses all over this country of ours, and I only found one out of 500. Does everybody know what that is? Because that is the state of the art of emergency planning in all of your organizations nationwide. As you can see, I should give you fair warning, I will be candid. So why do we plan and why do we train for emergencies? Well, I mentioned duty of care. I give lawyers uh, seminars on duty of care uh, regarding how uh, they should operate with their clients. Uh, and they take a day, they take a whole day. I'm going to give you uh, give you that whole day seminar one 
bumper sticker. Everything is always your fault. Whoever comes on your premises or on the apron of your premises uh, is your responsibility, whether it be two-legged or four-legged. Everybody, everything is always your fault regarding anybody on your premises. Uh, so why do we plan and train? Well, first, risk never sleeps. Uh, another reason we plan and train is that risk always multiplies. When these things start to happen, there are cascading negative events. It isn't just like a drill where, you know, we complain about the drill and we go back to work after 15 minutes. Emergencies go on for a long time, and they have cascading negative events, one thing bumping into another, making it worse and worse as we go along. So the first question I get when I come to a facility is tell me what's required by law. So who are the authorities, who is covered by the law, and who is the responsible, or responsible party under law? Well, first, OSHA is not a town in Wisconsin. OSHA is the Occupational Safety and Health Agency in Washington, D.C., which has been for 40-plus years writing regulations regarding employee safety for facilities like yours, which brings us to 29 CFR, which stands for Code of Federal Regulations, 1910.34, which reads in its entirety, sections 1910.34 through 1910.39 apply to workplaces in general industry, which is all of you, except mobile workplaces such as vessels, such as vehicles or vessels. So unless your facility is on a boat or a truck, you are subject to 1910.34 through 39. 1910.38 is an emergency action plan shall be written, and 1939 is a fire prevention plan shall be written. These over and above whatever your local laws might, um, might uh, demand of you. And of course, then there's the city and state fire code uh, where you are that adds into this. By the way, they all talk to each other as agencies, so they all mirror each other as far as what they demand. And then there's the NFPA, the National Fire Protection Association, which has been around since 1896 and has written over the last 120 years 300 standards. Those standards are incorporated almost in their entirety in your state fire codes by reference. NFPA is the source of standards in the United States regarding uh, fire, any kind of emergency. And NFPA 1600 is their standard on emergency management, disaster recovery, and business continuity. NFPA 1600 is recognized in law by the United States Congress as the standard to be used by all employers regarding their planning for, emergency, for emergencies. And in California, Florida, and Connecticut, it is a shall. It is embedded in these state three in these three states' fire codes as you shall do this and you shall use NFPA 1600. Now, nobody cares about Connecticut, where I'm from, we're a small state, but Florida and California, everybody cares about what goes on in Florida and California. Why? Well, 59 million Americans live in two states, Florida and California. One out of five Americans live in just these two states. And these two states, Florida and California, are the on-ramps to the apocalypse. Everything bad happens in California and Florida. Hurricanes, sinkholes, earthquakes, uh, you name it, it happens in these two states. They have had Departments of Homeland Security or uh, Offices of Emergency Management since World War II, long before any of your states or cities had one, because they get so many emergencies. And when they speak about a standard, everybody at, at court listens. And then there's a fire department sitting in New York, the best fire department in the world, they have the most robust emergency planning law in the world, and NFPA 1600 is, is their inspiration. Then there's Department of Homeland Security, which as of 2012 wrote regulations regarding all of your facilities that they expect you to comply with as far as emergencies are concerned. Their standard, NFPA 1600. Standard and Poor's, the people who write your credit rating, uh, went through a six-year period where they incorporated into their audits of your facilities looking at your emergency management, disaster recovery, business continuity plans, because Standard & Poor's is, in, is interested in resiliency. How quickly after an emergency can you come back to paying your employees and paying your bills? And shouldn't those questions be answered uh, as part of their uh, assessing you regarding your credit rating? So even the financial people are looking at this to talk about resiliency. How quickly can you come back to doing what you have to do, and that should be part of your credit rating? their standard NFPA 1600. So all of these very authoritative, long-standing uh, uh, groups have said that NFPA 1600 is the standard to which you shall comply. So OSHA says you shall create and train emergency action plans, and NFPA 1600 sets the contents, and the contents are all about all hazards. All hazards means this is not your father's fire plan. All hazards mean not just about fire and weather, 
but all of these things. This is a typical table of contents of the things that you have to cover. Now, you don't get to pick and choose your emergency. That's done for you by the standard because all of these are foreseeable circumstances, and the law says that you shall plan for foreseeable circumstances. Now, maybe you have done some things. Maybe these 10 things that I've picked out are things that you have done, uh, and that's great. Uh, head counts, uh, bomb threat, weather, suspicious package, but they all look pretty lonely when you put them up against the standard. So it isn't enough whether you like it or not. And then there's all sorts of other things that federal law requires. Special needs personnel, we used to call them disabled. You have to protect your visitors, your contractors, especially the embedded ones. You're required by law to have a head count during an emergency, and you have to train everybody. We will come back to these. So who is covered by all of these laws? Well, everybody's covered by some regulation or law at the federal or local level. Everybody's covered. Everything is your fault on your premises. And who is the responsible officer? The CEO says SCOTUS, the Supreme Court of the United States, which in two cases in front of the court ruled that the CEO of any employer is responsible for the implementation of uh, federal regulations regarding the safety of personnel. And they said that the CEO of your organization is responsible civilly, personally, and criminally. Does your CEO know this? Shouldn't they? Wouldn't you? So yes, you could have your CEO in an orange jumpsuit because you didn't plan and you didn't train under federal regulations. And it isn't just about the CEO. Once something bad happens, everybody becomes an ex expert and you will always become the bad guy as the employer. So trustees and directors, senior operations people, we can have a whole parade of people in orange jumpsuits. This just happened in California where a gentleman who runs a general contractor, one of his employees was killed, he didn't plan, he didn't train, he was just found guilty by a jury of his peers, and he's going to prison. So another reason we plan and train, that is the United States justice, justice is measured in dollars. More justice, more dollars. And juries are armed with commas and zeros. And most jurors are employees who have worked for companies like yours or have retired for companies like yours. And they expect that every employer has created a sanctuary of safety for their employees. That's their going in assumption because that's how they feel about it. Let's see how much this can cost you. This is the Cook County Fire in Chicago, Illinois. I am an expert consultant for the defendants. Six people died of smoke inhalation in a building filled with white collar workers, professional services people working for the tenants and all six of the people who died worked for the tenant employers inside. Uh, so these are the people who were found guilty Six dead, four to five billion dollars is the settlement. One Meridian Plaza in Philadelphia, three dead, four billion dollars in settlements against companies and organizations like yours. First Interstate Bank in Los Angeles, one dead, two billion dollars. So this stuff becomes very important. And none of these numbers I've thrown around include how much was paid to lawyers and to experts. All that's extra. Remember, everything is always your fault. Another reason we plan and train is we have to understand what the risks are to you. And when something bad happens, all of these statistics will be brought to bear uh, by outside agencies and by juries. 10,000 cardiac arrests every year in the American workplace, says the American Red Cross. Four million concussions yearly, says the CDC. Many of these things, many of these concussions occurring at work because when somebody gets hurt or killed at work, they fall down and hit their heads on the floor, the wall, a piece of furniture. 26 million Americans are confirmed adult diabetics, 18 plus. They take medicine, they are confirmed uh, diabetics. That's one out of nine people on your premises right now is an adult diabetic. Another 50 million are uh, uh, adults 18 plus who are diabetics and don't know it, or who are pre-diabetics. In other words, 75 million Americans, 18 plus, suffer from this condition. One out of three people on your premises on any given day on average suffers from this. So you can find somebody slumped over a chair or, or a desk or on the floor uh, unconscious and you have one minute to figure out whether or not to give them a glass of orange juice or call the EMTs. And you can't dawdle on this. You need to have a standard of care regarding your medical facility, regarding medical issues at your facility. We'll come back to that. Four million workplace injuries annually, says the U.S. Department of Justice. 
the Department of Justice also has done the research. Two million instances of workplace violence annually. This is yelling, screaming, pushing, shoving, all the way up to an active shooter. Every day, two people are murdered in the American workplace, as they will be today by a firearm or a knife. These are homicides. Every hour, 26 women will be raped. The hour we spend together today in the American workplace, 26 women will be raped. 350,000 hazardous material spills every year in the United States, says the NFPA. 800,000 shipments of hazardous materials, as defined by the federal government, shipped every day in the United States. 60,000 spills every year and a train on vehicle collision every 90 minutes. Trains carrying bad stuff, hitting vehicles, hitting bad, uh, hitting, uh, carrying bad stuff. So you could have something happen outside your facility, near your facility, and you have to shelter in place. A foreign, counterintuitive idea during an emergency, but you have to plan and train your employees for this kind of eventuality. One million calls are placed to 911 every day for real emergencies. These are not but calls. These are real emergency calls every day in the United States of America. 4,700 people killed in the American workplace every year, says OSHA. 112,000 structural fires at work, not residential, at work, says the NFPA, every year. And there's research on this. Four out of five organizations go out of business in two years that they haven't planned or trained after a major fire, workplace violence situation, after a major emergency, four out of five go out of business in two years that they haven't planned and trained. Nine out of 10 go out of business if they can't resume offering their service or their product within five days. This goes back to the idea we saw before in resiliency. How quickly can you come back? And these people go out of business within one year if they can't do come back to offering their product or service within five days after the emergency. By the way, both of these statistics are being borne out by Hurricane Sandy on the East Coast, almost down to the percentage point. So what are the senior management excuses for not planning and training? Because this is a problem with senior management. Many of the people listening here probably believe in doing this right, but senior management is thwarting them. Well, first there's, hey, it's the landlord's problem. I'm a tenant. Landlord has no obligation your requirements regarding emergency planning and training in federal, state, or local law. Your landlord's plan is not your plan. It's the landlord's plan, and it has nothing to do with keeping you safe, because landlords are very, very bad at this, and it doesn't comply with your obligations under state, federal, or local law. Landlords are so evil at emergency planning that cable TV has dedicated a whole week to landlords. Even sharks watch Landlord Week. That's how bad they are. Common mistakes in emergency plans, well, there's so many. Let's go through them quickly here. First, we aren't compliant with OSHA, the City State Fire Code, and NFPA 1600. We've just ignored these things. We haven't paid attention. We haven't paid attention to visitors, contractors, the second and third shift. If there are people on your premises any time during uh, the week, Sunday, late at night, coming in early, you're, they're your responsibility for emergency action planning and training. Visitors and contractors are least likely to know your facility, the most likely to panic, freeze, not cooperate, then sue and win. So let's talk about security at your facility. Now, security facility is very, very important. Premises, uh, uh, you know, secu uh, perimeter security, very, very important. But understand you can't stop crazy. Adam Lanza, who was the gentleman who came in at uh, Sandy Hook and killed 26 people, shot his way with, through the front door with an automatic weapon. You can't stop crazy. And no one expects you to stop crazy. Preventing this stuff is very, very difficult, and you can't stop crazy. And no court in the world will hold you responsible. But what they do hold you responsible for is what is your response and how did you train your employees regarding that response. And also remember, as you're looking at security, we have met the enemy, and it is us. Because you can build you know, barbed wire and moats around your facility, but then your employee holds the door open for somebody or props it open during the summer because it's hot or goes in and out because of a smoke break. Your employees can be the people who undo everything that you've done. So you have to understand that the enemy is probably inside and is one of your employees. You need to do an assessment of your security to understand exactly what's going on there. And you really need a third party outside to do that because A, you probably don't have that expertise internally and B, if you do, 
any third-party assessment is immediately dismissed by any third-party agency like OSHA or the fire department or whatever, and certainly by, a jur by juries, they do not look at internal assessments because they assume that they have been influenced by politics, command uh, influence, et cetera. And you need to involve law enforcement because these are the people you're going to call when the time comes and you have a problem. Equipment and systems alone will never so so solve the problem because your employees open doors. You show me a 50-foot wall, I'll show you a 51-foot ladder. Alone, the systems can't solve your problem. You've got to have planning and training for employees to make sure that this is enforced, which brings us to training. Training is very, very important and command control and communications. We'll come back to that in a moment. And did I mention training? Training is so important for any of this if you're going to be successful. So let's talk about your emergency team. OSHA requires that every employer have an emergency team made up of employees. Why? Well, because, here's an insight for you, police, fire, and EMTs are not the first responders. They are the official responders. The first responders in your organization are your employees. You cannot change the physics and the time and the space. If you go down and that person sitting next to you right now is your first responder and their obligation may be to apply first aid or to call somebody or something, but the employees are always the first responders. Whether so it's a fire, medical situation, a guy with a gun, they're always the first responders. Police, fire, and EMTs are the official responders. And this is what your lobby is going to look like in a typical situation. Uh, within four minutes, we hope, uh, one person is going to show up that's going to be a police officer. It's always a police officer. And then he or she will be followed by other officers from police, fire, EMTs, whatever. It's going to take some time, and after maybe 10 minutes, you might have three or four people uh, in the lobby or facility, hopefully talking to one of you as the commander of your facility for emergencies. No, the police don't go up to every one of your 100 or 1,000 employees inside your facility to hold their hand and look in their eyes and tell them what to do. They bark orders to your people who bark orders to your employees. That's the chain of communication during an emergency. So even after the police and fire come, you're still in command, you still have to be in command and control of your facility because they are going to tell you what to do and you have to get that word out. This is command, control, and communications. If you've ever been in the military or part of an emergency services, we always want somebody in command. They have to be able to exercise control through a team of people, and they have to be able to communicate with each other and do so quickly. And I find that when going to uh, facilities, there are not enough commanders, and there is no chain of command. If that person, number one, isn't here, number two takes over with the full authority to act and has been trained to do so. And we need a deep chain of command because you have a very mobile group of people who are always moving around in and out of the facility. We never know who's going to be here when the emergency strikes. So we have to have a chain of command with enough commanders. And as far as the size of your emergency team is concerned, well, I find the two few team members as far as the number of people who are in your emergency team. Now, you won't be surprised to understand that there are all sorts of standards recognized by all those people who are going to judge you after an emergency occurs at your facility, the National Response Framework, the National Incident Management System, the Incident Command System, and NFPA 1600 all agree on the size, what the size should be of your emergency team, one to five. If you have 100 employees, it's supposed to be 20, uh, 20 of your employees in the emergency team. If you have 1,000, 200, and so on, one out of five. Now, you may think that some uh, regulator sitting in a windowless basement in Washington, D.C. came up with this number. That's not true. This number goes back to Alexander the Great, who in his campaign journals talks about one to five is the best way to supervise. And it is in all the standards because this is how the military has been doing it and the emergency management world has been doing it for a century. In fact, if you look at your own table of organization inside your own uh, company or campus, you will find that if you ask somebody to put down all the titles of supervisors versus those supervised, out of the fog will come one to five, often one to four and one to three. This is how organizations get run. We have one supervisor for every five people. And we have to train them uh, and plan them across all of these things. The slide I showed you before, all hazards planning. So your response may be this, yikes. So how do we address this? We have many threats, many procedures, but we have one team, one team that's been trained to do this, just like you manage a department. You have managers for this particular activity of emergency response. And this slide, I think, says it all. 
EAP is emergency action plan. It's the center of everything. Uh, you have an emergency team. You train the emergency team and all employees. CCC is command control and communications. And if you have other things by way of uh, uh, plans that need to be compliant, they should all click together as far as the EAP is concerned. You should have one plan and one team that respond to every kind of emergency. That's how this works best. And that brings us to communications. Many people use cells, landlines, and, and other things to communicate. All of these things you have to plan will fail during an emergency because classically the power does go off. It's the second thing that happens in all emergencies. Cells are going to be useless during an emergency because they're point to point. You can't talk to a lot of people. And if somebody gives you voicemail, you know, you have failed. Uh, and cell phones can be cut off by the police and fire departments within minutes of the start of the emergency because they think of it as a terrorism event. You may not agree with their protocol, but that's how they think. So how do you communicate as far as head counts, injured people, and unfolding situations are concerned? Well, the answer is you have to have two-way radios, walkie-talkies, call them what you will, but these are undefeatable when they're used by your emergency team on your premises. It's the only way that you can operate to successfully respond to an emergency. Great plans are a smart thing. Training is everything. If we don't get the words off paper in people's heads, then we have failed. Training is everything. Which brings me to this iconic photograph, the so-called miracle on the Hudson. This plane took off six and a half years ago from LaGuardia Airport, lost both engines to bird strikes, and within four and a half minutes had to land on the Hudson River. On board were 150 people like you and me, civilians, suddenly submitted to a potentially lethal emergency to which they had to respond, and there they are responding. Now, normally when planes fall out of the sky, everybody dies. Those are the stubborn physics of plane crashes. Here, all 150 people on board went home to see their families that night. The worst injury was a broken arm, thus calling it the miracle on the Hudson. So when stuff like this happens, experts like me turn to other experts to try to find examples of how all this works in emergencies to share with people like you. So I turned to the NTSB, the National Transportation Safety Board, and asked them for examples of how this works with civilians like you and me suddenly submitted to an emergency that can happen, like, the, like those that can happen in your facility. They came back with two examples, two Boeing 737 aircraft, both of which crashed and burned at airports and gave their occupants two minutes to get out. In Canada, with 150 people on board, no fatalities. In Greece, with 137 people on board, 55 people died. So this is what happened after two minutes for those two airplanes. They burst into flames, giving their people only two people only two minutes to get out. Why is there a difference here? This is the same aircraft. They both crashed and burned at airports. They both gave uh, both airplanes gave uh, their occupants two minutes to get out before they exploded. What's the difference here? Because there is a big difference, and the difference is, and this is NTSB in a written analysis. They're written analysis of plane crashes are hundreds of pages long and take a year to produce. They said that in the non-fatal crash in Canada, just about everybody on board was a frequent business flyer who had for scores if not hundreds of times listened to the flight attendant, tell them what to do when the plane crashed and burned, and then they went ahead and did it. Unfortunately, in Greece, everybody on board was a first-time flyer. These were families in a charter going on vacation. None of the passengers had ever been inside a jet aircraft before. 55 people died. NTSB in their written analysis went on to report that a majority of those 55 people were still buckled in their seatbelts. So frozen were they that they couldn't even unbuckle their seatbelts to save their own lives or the lives of the family members sitting next to them. So survival on the Hudson was not the result of a miracle. It was the result of training. People were told what to do before the emergency such that when the emergency occurred, they knew exactly what to do. Training is mandatory under OSHA regulations. You shall train all personnel. You shall train them in a classroom. You shall train them annually. You shall train them at a hire. And you shall use a qualified trainer defined by OSHA as someone who has the experience and or training to stand in front of a group of people and tell them what to do across all the emergencies we've talked about. On-screen training can supplement. It can never substitute for the classroom training on an annual basis. OSHA's had an opinion, many opinions on this, since 1985 when videotape, yes, there was something called videotape once, was introduced into corp corporate conference rooms. And they love on-screen training, but it can never substitute for the annual classroom training. 
And then I hear this one all the time. Employees hate these stuff. Well, we'll, tr we'll scare them. It takes too much time. This is all bull. This is all senior management projecting some kind of mythology on their employees. Why do I know this? Well, there are national surveys on this. Employees like yours across America have been asked what is the most important issue at work. 85% of American employees come back and say their most important issue at work is safety. They really believe that this is the most important issue at work. And it beat out all the things I thought would be number one, wages, leave, sick time, vacation. These were all a distant number two, all below 50%. The, your employees believe that you have created a sanctuary of safety regarding your workplace, and they believe that safety is their number one issue. I have trained 24,000 employees over the last 14 years. At the end of our training session, we give them all a uh, survey that is anonymous and confidential and ask them to give it to me, not to their bosses, so that I can read it, anonymous and confidential. We essentially ask them, did they get it as far as the training is concerned? Were they confident now they knew what to do? Across all hazards, 98.5% came back that said that they were confident or very confident that they knew what to do under any emergency that occurred to them. Now, ladies and gentlemen, we know that this level of confidence didn't come out of my training because of my boyish charm. It came out because we made the training all about them and their safety, their most important issue. We took the scary out of the discussion. We made everybody comfortable. We empowered all employees to know what to do when the peat moss hits the fan. It's ironic that so many would love the training. I also get commentary in the margins from why didn't we do this before Before and can we train more than annually? Because that whole thing about active shooter was a little complicated. Maybe we need to go over that again. The American military expression is correct. People don't rise to the occasion. In an emergency, people don't rise to the occasion. I'm going to burst your bubbles, ladies and gentlemen. Bruce Willis does not exist. The idea that the untrained itinerant visitor who's in your premises when the emergency occurs suddenly rises up and saves everybody's lives is pure Hollywood, total fiction. We don't rise to the occasion during an emergency. We sink to our level of training. And untrained, we just sink. Common mistakes, no head counts. You're supposed to account for everybody during an emergency. This is required by federal law. It is black letter law and has been for decades. You need a real process vital to safety. And a real process means not a number two pencil and a clipboard. You've got to have a very, very serious way of, of complying with the regulations. How bad can this get? This is Houston, Texas, May 2013, a couple of years ago. Uh, this was a one-story uh, facility. A fire started. 200 people were inside. Uh, somebody pulled the fire alarm, uh, and uh, the uh, fire department showed up. The chief fire chief for, uh, for Houston turned to the CEO of the, the guy who runs the facility and said, can you account for everybody? He said, no, I can't account for everybody. People move in. People walk out. There's no way I can do that. That's, that's impossible to do, probably a response that each and every one of you would have. He, as the police a fire chief, then sent his people into the building. The roof collapsed and killed four of his fire officers. Killed them. Turns out in the after action report, which is done by the AG, the Attorney General for the State of Texas, as well as by the fire department, indicated that everybody was out of the building within two minutes after the fire started. Long before the fire department got there, everybody was out. The CEO couldn't tell the chief what to do, and the chief did what Every police and fire chief does anywhere in the country. When they don't know that everybody's okay, they send people in the building. Four people die. If he'd had a head count, he would know where his people are. If he could account for people, he'd know where his people are, and these people wouldn't have died. So you got to do this stuff, and there are consequences that with which you have to live if you don't do it right. Evacuation maps. These are the maps that should not just be in the lobby next to the elevator or when you walk into your facility. They're acquired by law, must be for every employee from any and all parts of every building. So they have to be displayed all over the building. All of that is in these regulations from OSHA. I'm not making this stuff up. Medical emergency. Medical emergencies are probably the most common emergency you're going to run into and you need a standard of care. Every employer is required to have a standard of care. This tells everybody what to do when there is a medical emergency. You need to establish a standard of care for each of your facilities. It tells employers, what, employees what to do when an employee or a visitor goes down and exactly how we're supposed to respond, when to call 911, 
first aid training, if you can't guarantee, that's OSHA's word, not mine, that you can have EMTs with, a, with uh, standing next to the person who's injured or, or, or sick within four minutes, then you shall train people in first aid. And you need to prohibit the transporter off-premises, an employee, take an employee to the uh, hospital as an example, because that employee is now your agent. And if they collide with somebody, hurt somebody more, or if that person they're transporting goes into cardiac arrest, that's all on you. Your duty of care is to make sure that everybody's safe. So you've got to have a plan that makes sure that everybody knows what they're doing. And you need, to, you need to assign as an employer who is trained and how many people are trained in first aid. And if you train people in first aid, you shall have a first aid plan and OSHA regulations, and you shall have a bloodborne pathogen plan and train both. Evacuation maps have to look like this with a primary and secondary um, uh, escape route. That's what a, a competent evacuation map looks like. Most, I can say with confidence, none of you have these things. Evacuation maps are required by law, and there are the citations for them. Special needs personnel used to call them Disabled, wheelchair, hard of seeing and hearing, no English, crutches temporarily, women who are pregnant, mobility challenge. These are all people under ADA and OSHA and NFPA 1600 who are qualified as special needs personnel, whether it be visitors or employees on your premises. So these are nice people you're supposed to protect, special needs personnel. Required by federal, state, and law that you have people uh, that you have this in your plan and you train people for pregnant, moving slowly, hard of hearing, temporary crutches. The cleaning crew at night is your responsibility. Employees, contractors, visitors, and in 2011, ADA changed the regulations for the first time in 30 or 40 years, and they doubled down on the severity of them. And you have to integrate this into your emergency team as far as planning and training is concerned. You're required to have a plan of list of disabled that your emergency commander gives to the building management or your property management if you own the building, so that can be turned over to fire and police when they come to your building, which means you need to implement a buddy system. People were assigned to each of those people to take care of them as they go along during the emergency. And if somebody is a, a special needs person shows up as a visitor, then reception or whoever receives that person needs to notify somebody of authority inside your facility to make sure that they're taken care of during an emergency. That is your duty of care. And these are all the regulations that uh, apply as far as special needs personnel are concerned. And this is just the tip of the iceberg. Then I hear this one, no one cares. You know, when was the last time somebody came in and asked you to look at your emergency action plan or, or your training records? No one cares. I really don't care if no one else cares. Could be the response of your management. This is a common belief. But please understand the 200,000 calls, phone calls are made to OSHA every year on the toll-free number. Even the phone call is free. Anybody can call up, and under federal law, all of them have to be investigated, no matter how wild or hoaxy they may be. Every complaint has to be, by law, investigated. Now, the costs and fines are de minimis, as the lawyers say. They aren't very much. But the senior time in lawyers, this will kill you. It's very, very expensive. And then look at this. This is the forever stamp. I have a client in New York City in a high-rise with 800 people in that high-rise on many floors. She got a letter from OSHA saying, Dear Madam CEO, paragraph, we have a complaint you don't have an OSHA compliant emergency action plan, period, paragraph. Please send us your plan and your training records for the last three years, period. Sincerely, less than 50 words, and she's nicked. Now, she had her plan and everything together, so she sent it off. We never heard from anybody again. Could you comply with that? This costs 46 cents. That's the cost of enforcement. Send you a letter and expect you to come back with the paperwork. The, neg the negligence issues, once again, are failure to plan and failure to train, the very issues we're talking about. And under law, negligence is presumed if you do not comply with the regulations. And the courts love the NFPA, which has the standard that says you shall plan on an all-hazards basis. And SCOTUS, the Supreme Court of the United States, has already ruled on this, no one cares. There are precautions so imperative, even their universal disregard will not excuse omission. This is a decision written on these very kinds of safety regulations at the federal level. Again, everything is always your fault. Fire extinguisher training is illegal. This is another mistake I see. You have to have a use or don't use policy, both of which are legal. Do you want people to use a fire extinguisher or not? That is up to you as the employer to decide. Go ahead and decide it and then train it. If you do want to train people in uh, fire extinguishers, you have to put them in a concert room. 
You have to show them the approved video. You have to have a certified trainer. You have to take them outside in a live burn. That is what it looks like to have people who are trained annually. This has to happen every year. That's what OSHA says. So if you haven't done that, then you don't have people trained in um, the use of fire extinguishers. And if you've asked people or told people to use them, then you're not in compliance and you're in deep trouble. This is a negligence issue. Plagiarism. How many times do I see this, that people copy other people, especially in the school world, but it happens across the board in America. Somebody takes the headquarters plan and applies it to their site. Well, you can't do that because the headquarters is not your facility. It's much different, and you have to write it site specifically. Uh, I have a buddy. He knows what he's doing. I'll use his plan. You can't cut and paste emergency planning. This is about the safety of your employees, and any expert like me or any outsider who can come in and after reading one page of your plan know that this has been cut and paste or has been plagiarized. I also see plans out of date. Anything that isn't three or four years old, anything older than three or four years is out of date because the landscape of regulations change all the time. And then I hear this, you know, we've had no incidents. We're a family. I love that. And we've been lucky. But luck is not a strategy. So what are the senior management excuses? Well, they all add up to denial. And this is what your senior management looks like as far as their denial is concerned regarding emergency planning for your facilities, all of your facilities. So how do we sell this? How do we as people who are perhaps at middle to senior management sell this, sell this to our CEO and uh, his or her peers? Well, return on investment. I always get asked, what's the return on investment for doing this? And my answer is, if we're never hit, our ROI is zero. Thank God. And if we are hit, our ROI is measured in the tens of millions of dollars saved or not, depending upon whether or not we planned and trained. So let me break it down for you what I think your return on investment is. Protect the brand, the brand reputation of your organization. Protect your people. Protect the CEO's posterior. Protect your productivity. It's all about getting people back to work. Protect your bank account. 85% of, of your people have identified safety and will appreciate the work that you've done. 98% of them will love this stuff and are now trained to respond. We bond employees to a safety culture. We build employee awareness. We knock down silos. I was in a presentation once where somebody stood up and said, Bo, we don't have silos. We have cylinders of excellence. Well, okay, you're cylinders of excellence. You've got to get everybody talking to each other. Integrate safety into their jobs and still a sense of responsibility and increase employee ownership. I think this is a huge return on investment. I hope you do too. And these are the tools you need to convince management you gotta do it right. Some of these are about safety, some of these are about money, all of them are about compliance and culture. And productivity, getting people back to work is everything. So let's summarize where we've been before where we've been today. We have a planning continuum. We focus on the emergency action plan because that starts everything off. Plan, train, drill, and exercise are words in law. You have to make these distinctions as you plan and train everybody. Risk never sleeps. Risk always multiplies. We have a lot of threats, all of which means that these emergencies are foreseeable circumstances and thus emergencies for which you have to plan, whether you like it or not. And there are a lot of threats out there. The statistics are all there. Four out of five without a plan and training go out of business within two years after a major emergency. If you can't, oper if you can't uh, return to operations in five days, after an emergency, nine out of 10 go out of business in one year. So what are the 17 common mistakes? Well, first, uh, we don't have an emergency action plan or fire prevention plan that is compliant with law, and you gotta have that. Uh, you've got to uh, understand that your CEO is the responsible party, civilly, personally, and criminally, and you don't want this for him or her. And it isn't just about him or her, it's about everybody in your organization. Could this be your CEO? Do you want to be one? Uh, do you and yours want to be in this parade? I think not. Number two, the landlord is not responsible for your planning and training. Landlords are very, very bad at this. You don't want to be involved with your landlord except to coordinate with him and make sure that he's doing what you want. All hazards plan. You have to plan for everything whether you like it or not. Special needs personnel, we have to take care of them under the law, and there's lots of law on the matter. Number five, ignore critical personnel, visitors, contractors, second and third shifts. We have to take care of these people because they can screw up our response. Head counts are required by law under federal law. Training is required by law, all for the emergency team, all employees, 
uh, a fire extinguisher policy, fire extinguisher training. Training is everything. Mandatory for all personnel in a classroom annually at hire by a qualified trainer. We don't rise to the occasion. We sink to our level of training and untrained we just sink. Number eight, emergency team not big enough. Because police, fire, and ambulance are not the uh, first responders, our employees are the first responders, and we need to have one to five if we're going to comply with these standards. Not enough commanders and no chain of command. Communications is too often left to cells or the PA system. We really need two-way radios. Evacuation maps, you don't have them, and you're supposed to have them throughout your facility with a primary and secondary means of egress during emergency. Standard of care under medical emergency. You got to have a standard of care. You got to tell people what to do when somebody gets hurt or injured. And once you start down that path of training people in first aid, you got to have a first aid plan and a bloodborne pathogen plan. Security. You can't stop crazy. You got to understand your your employees can be the enemy of your security. Do an assessment. Involve law enforcement. Equipment alone will never solve your problem. And training, training, training. Uh, fire extinguisher training illegal. You have to use or don't use policy. You have to train them in a conference room with a video uh, approved certified trainer and then do a live burn. Number 14, um, uh, number 15 is plagiarism. Uh, people copying uh, other people, you can't copy and paste emergency planning. Plans are out of date, thus they are not useful to what it is that's going on in June of 2015. No one cares, don't fall into this trap. Somebody cares and they can reach out to you for little or no money. And now we said 17 uh, uh, mistakes. I'm going to give you two bonuses. Number one, luck is not a strategy. You can't go down this thinking in terms of denial. And number 19, no independent audit. You need an independent audit of your current emergency planning, just like you look at your financials on an annual basis. You do this with an outside independent audit. What's your return on investment? I think it's huge. Lots of things that, that come to you by way of return on investment. So we've learned that a dollar prevention is worth $10 million of cure. The threats are manifest. The vulnerabilities on your facility are ubiquitous and foreseeable. The responsibility is absolute, and the liabilities are titanic. Wow, there it is. And everything is always your fault. That's your duty of care. I realize this is a huge, ugly job. It's a long to-do list, big responsibility, few resources, no one wants to do this, no support from management, because it takes time, money, people, expertise, either internal and external or both, and management support. So how do we sell it? That's what HDWSI stands for, planning, training, drills, and exercises. That's how you solve the problem. There is no magic here. You've got to do the basics. So how do we uh, convince the board, the management, and employees to protect our people, property, productivity, and posterior? I realize giving this done is, uh, is tough, and I've learned that the scariest word in any organization is not cost, it's not price, it's not budget, it's not headcount, it's change. Change is scary for organizations because it's painful, it's time-consuming, it's expensive. Did I mention painful? It's very painful. And I've learned in all organizations, change almost always occurs because of blunt force trauma from the outside, never by inspired leadership from the inside, unless you supply that inspired leadership. So my recommendations are abandon denial, recognize the titanic threats, alert your CEO, assess your facility, get compliant, all hazards plan, train everybody, and exercise the program. For you, I have the Ten Commandments of Planning. This is a legal brief on what planning uh, uh, is required by, uh, what the planning parameters are that are required by law, and the Ten Commandments of Training, which bring you all the citations I've talked about today about why training is required by law in its detail. As far as an action plan is concerned, you need an assessment of your organization's current emergency planning and training, just like your uh, financials. This is the only way you can start the process to sell it internally and are need a third-party independent assessment because no one inside is going to be believed to any third party when as and if something occurs. This won't be easy, but that's our mission, the safety of all personnel. If you'd like those um, um, documents, the Ten Commandments I mentioned before, here is my email address. Thank you very much. Are there any questions? Wow, outstanding. Um, okay, 
we do have some questions and I want to remind everybody how to ask questions. We've gotten a few during the presentation, maybe people who have attended our webinars in the past. Um, each of you has a control panel that came up when you joined through GoToWebinar and there is a section there called questions. Just hit the arrow, pull that down and type away and we will see your questions and um, I'll be able to ask those live for everyone's benefit. And if you don't get your questions answered, I have learned today from Bo that that will be my fault. <laughs> so please uh, send your questions. Uh, we want to make sure that we, we get everybody's answered. There was a lot of great information there. Um, okay, let's start with, there was a lot about training, so let's start with a question about, about training. Can my human resources department uh, people train employees and new hires is the question. Probably not. Uh, OSHA says that a qualified trainer is somebody who's qualified by dint of experience and training, and with all due respect to your HR people, they probably can't stand up to that standard. Now, maybe you have people with your security or your environmental health and safety or some other kind of a group that can do that, but my experience is that everybody's in their own silo, so they know a little bit about a lot, but they don't know a lot about everything. Um, so that's a real problem. You need a qualified trainer, qualified by training and uh, experience, those people are not easy to find inside your organization, but there are outside people who can do this, and that's the way to go. Hire somebody from the outside who comes in and does this for you on, on a yearly basis. Got it. Makes sense. Um, another one about training, can we train live in one building? And, and you talked about this, though, about um, you know the, the live training, I think, being irreplaceable, right, and that over, over video conference doesn't work, but what if they did a combination? This says, can we train live in one building and video conference that training to other facilities? Uh, you should not be shocked that all of these questions have been asked of OSHA over the last 30 years since 1985. People have asked, can I use an 800 number? Uh, can I have some people live and some people um, uh, listening in live, so to speak, but in remote uh, areas? They said no all across the way. That's fine as far as it goes, but if you don't have the live uh, classroom training where people are in the room where quote, questions can be asked and answered uh, and people can have uh, that kind of experience with the trainer in the room, then it's not legal. In other words, all this on-screen stuff is good, but it's not compliant if you try to substitute it for the annual classroom training. So go with the live burn like you showed us, right? <laughs> um, exactly, exactly. All right. What about a nonprofit? This says we're a nonprofit. Are we also required to have formal written plans? Everybody is required to do this, uh, including the Pentagon, uh, the American Red Cross. Uh, when the act was passed by Congress in 1970, December, uh, everybody lined up to try to get an exemption, including nonprofits, 501c3s. Uh, so wild was this discussion that uh, the Congress went back in early 1971 and actually passed a law including nonprofits to make sure that there were no ambiguities or confusion on this because the Congress believed uh, and wrote into law that it doesn't matter for whom you work, every employee has a right to be safe and we can't leave this to the employee to figure out when the, uh, when the emergency occurs. That's the job of the employer. Okay. Um, you talked a lot about duty of care, and I think this, I, I'm glad that you did that today. That, that term gets thrown around quite a lot, I think, in our industry, and to have it quantified and, and really crystallized in the way that you did was, was tremendous. Um, okay, this one says, how does one train vendors who may bring in different people with each visit, and then he gives an example uh, like a cleaning facility, or cleaning the facility, I'm assuming. A lot of you have vendors uh, who are uh, the cleaning crew at night, uh, a cafeteria crew, uh, your security officers may be a, a contractor. Uh, there are lots of contractors that are embedded in your facility. OSHA says that you are the host employer, therefore responsible for every contractor, every employee who works for a contractor on your premises, and you must treat them like full-time employees. In my view, that means you want to train your embedded contractors just like you're doing employees because you need to have unification of command. Yes, your contractors all say they have emergency plans and that they train your employee. My experience in looking at hundreds of these organizations is that's all bull. They don't have a plan. 
Uh, it doesn't cover the kinds of emergencies that uh, we talk about in your facility. And of course, it's written generically as the contractor for any facility they may serve, not site specific for your facility. And that's all you care about. So yes, I guess you could go in front of a jury and say, well, my contractor has a plan and he trains his employees, therefore I'm okay. But you have to police all that. And if it, all, if, if it isn't all integrated into your plan and your training for your facility, then you're going to be in trouble because you haven't done your duty of care, you are the host employer, and you have to treat them as if they're a, a full-time employee, whether you like it or not. Okay. For, for medical emergencies, this one says, um, it sounds like we have to call 911 every time someone <laughs> stubs their toe. Really? Is the question. <laughs> Yeah, and, 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 and this is, uh, you know, if this were easy and if this were cheap and if this were fast, you wouldn't be on this, uh, um, on this uh, webinar and you would have already done it. None of this is easy. So you have to write a standard of care, as I, I talked about before, which defines how the employer, meaning you, at that particular facility, responds to a medical emergency. And yes, there's going to be gray areas. No, you're not going to uh, uh, call uh, 911 when somebody, you know, for every little uh, kind of thing. But you have to define where you are going to call 911. You are the employer. You are responsible. You are not under law permitted to let employees make this up on a retail basis. You have to, as the employer, uh, decide this. And this is where decisions have to be made on the run by your own people. You've got to have supervision. You don't allow your employees to run around without managers in any particular department, and we don't allow them to do that as far as emergencies are concerned. So they need to start calling people and get supervisors involved, your emergency team, to look at this thing and say, this qualifies under standard, our standard of care not to call anybody. We're stopping here. Or under our standard of care, it qualifies that we do call somebody. In my experience, as soon as you start to tr try to play medical doctor and make decisions about, you know, who should go, who sh shouldn't go, you're going to be in trouble because none of you is an MD. And we don't listen to the person who's been hurt or injured. That person may say to you, I'm fine, I'm going back to work. I'm fine, and I'm going back to work should be the scariest words you've ever heard after an employee's had an injury or has been sick because if that employee has another uh, incident during the day, uh, which is always going to be worse than the first one. That is your fault. Your duty of care was not exercised to make sure that that person was safe. So you have to be very careful in your standard of care to make sure that all this is laid out so that other employees and your emergency team know how to respond and get that person the help that they need. Okay, thank you. Uh, this one is, says, in a global or multinational company, do you find that planning to the U.S. level of standards and for organizations is sufficient, or are there even more stringent expectations in, say, Europe or Asia? Uh, the answer is it depends. Uh, England, as an example, has much, and Canada have much stricter uh, standards and laws than we do, um, uh, and they've, they've been doing it a longer time enforcing this kind of thing. Especially in England, uh, they go to the criminal thing uh, very, very quickly, and it's also true for most of Western Europe. Uh, so it depends. Uh, the U.S. standard may measure up to most Western European and Japanese standards, or may not. And you are required, and you're going to be found. It's going to be found that in most uh, situations, whoever has the strictest standard is the one you're supposed to apply worldwide. Uh, again, these are juries and courts uh, looking at this, and this is how the uh, uh, the law gets applied. When you go into South America or so, uh, most Asian places, including China especially China. They don't have anything like what we have or what Western Europe has. And your standards in the U.S. will be the higher standard and thus uh, uh, serve you well in those other places. Again, this is all very complicated. It isn't easy. If it were easy, you have already done it. True. Um, to, the, to the gentleman that asked that question, if you have any follow-up to that, please send it through. We've only got one more question, so I want to make sure we get it answered. Um, the last question we have is is this, why does an all hazards approach mean we have to plan for emergencies we might never have, like earthquakes in Missouri? Uh, you don't get to pick and choose your emergencies. Uh, by the way, the worst earthquake that has ever occurred in the world occurred two centuries ago in Missouri. So uh, 
you, you know, and we had earthquakes in, in Manhattan a couple of years ago, and no one knew what to do. You don't get to pick and choose your emergencies. The standard has set the emergencies that, for which you should plan and train because no one can predict this stuff. The very nature of emergencies is that they're unpredictable. So you don't get to pick and choose the emergencies, and we have a, a, a saying in our business, uh, you always get the emergency for which you didn't plan. Murphy's Law. It, it just works that way, and that's why we have a standard, some place where we can all go and agree, okay, there's the list, that's what we plan for. Uh, that's the way you're going to be treated at court. Uh, you really don't have any choices to matter. So true. Well, Bo, this has been tremendous. Uh, thank you so much for today's presentation. If anyone would like more information about Bo's services, please visit 911consulting.com. And also remember to check us out at continuityhousing.com or leave a comment in the survey if you are interested in how we might provide your critical employees with guaranteed hotel housing when the success of your plan depends on it. Last, uh, a very, very brief survey about this webinar will pop up when you close your browser. Please take the 30 to 40 seconds um, to answer those questions. It really does help us continually improve our content and our presentations for you, and we, we value your feedback quite a bit. For Bo Mitchell of 911 Consulting and our behind the scenes guy today, Fred Rogers of Continuity Housing, who's running the show, I'm Michelle Lowther. Thank you for joining us and have a terrific and productive day.